Thank goodness it's Friday. I'm Roger King, and you're listening to TGIF Geocaching Radio. Hey, thanks for tuning in. It's TGIF. This month's episode is brought to you by The Park and Grab. The Park and Grab Geocache is a cutesy, self-explanatory name for a geocache that, well, it gives the geocacher a quick smiley and a quick fix. <laughs> Pull up, get out, and hopefully within a minute or two tops, you're writing ink on paper having found that geocache. It's so common, there's now an attribute to search by and help identify these simpletons of geocaching. Save them for those days when you just need to find something quickly. This is TGIF, Geocaching Radio, a monthly pod with a dose of geocaching news and adventure contests and hot topics and highlighting the many experiences that may await you. And I'm Jeff, a.k.a. The Bruce Zero, so stay tuned and let's hang out. Welcome! How have you been? We are back from holidays and off on a new year. It has been a busy two months. So much has been going on, it's just hard to keep track and find time. Don't you sometimes wish that a day just had, like, another few hours? Sometimes to get stuff done, but, you know, sometimes just for geocaching, right? (laughs) So, what's new? Well, a lot at GCHQ, but here at CTLHQ, there's been no shortage of things that leave little time for actually getting out and going geocaching. Back in November being GIF year, we had events worldwide hosting the Geocaching International Film Festival. Uh, I was excited to once again host uh, a local event. I like to host them in a cinema to have that wonderful experience of the big screen and good sound and all of that stuff. And so uh, it's been a couple of years since we've been able to do that for various obvious reasons. And, uh, and it was just great to be able to host that again. And, uh, and it was a lot of fun, great feedback, um, some themed content as well, and uh, prizes and just basically a whole lot of stuff to make an event more fun to attend. And uh, that on top of enjoying this year's 18 different films, short films that people had made, it was just it was fantastic. And uh, so congratulations to everybody who uh, was chosen as a finalist. If you follow the podcast, then the Previous episode was an interview with Craig, C. Michelle, Dave, London Westy, and Rich Comachino, who uh, each released a film uh, in the final reel. And we just sat around and chatted about their experiences, and it was just really cool. So if you haven't heard that episode, tune in. It'll link in the show notes as well. Oh, and if you didn't already know, there are at least 21 different trackable codes in the GIF reel. Sometimes filmmakers like to toss in some of their personal TB codes, and if you're quick and observant, then you can snap them and capture and, uh, and, and discover their trackables on your spare time. That reel has been released, so you can find the link to that video in the show notes. But really the big thing on the plate right now, GeoCoins! <laughs> Project EGA is really progressing. Since last episode, all the core path tags have arrived, and we were off to the manufacturing line. And up soon, packaging orders, and then fulfilling the shipping. Anyone who contributed on Indiegogo can now view their orders and status and shipment content online. You can check out the December 25th update on the campaign page for details. Plus, there's a page to see the progress for the whole project. Now, a really cool development on the cash line front is that CLHQ recently provided improved specifications for their portal technology to integrate since Tiny Tim was promoted in the treasure troops. That means it's being integrated into every order of artifacts. But now, in update number 18, posted January 28th, I included a letter from Tiny Tim himself with some slightly concerning news from CLHQ, which I'll read you later in the episode. So check it all out. All the links are in the show notes. I also just came back from a Florida trip over the new year. I and my other half, my now wife Stephanie, who joined me in TGIF episode number one back in October 2022, we set out on this road trip vacation. 
I must first kind of disclaim this was not a geocaching road trip, but there was a bit of geocaching. While planning the trip, I made sure to find time for the most highest of priority targets. So we got a number of webcams and a few virtual caches and a handful of physical geocaches, although it seemed like there were more DNFs than I was really satisfied with. It made sticking to non-physical geocaches more appealing for this trip, but the trip was fantastic. We saw alligators and turtles and birds and lizards and snakes and seafood, so many shells, and at the last minute we got to watch a SpaceX Falcon Heavy lift off from the Kennedy Space Center, and after DNFing one chance at an FTF, another one popped up just in time to snag an FTF on New Year's Day. <laughs> So for the last night of the year, we headed to Key West and the southernmost point of mainland USA. We caught the last light of 2023, the sunset at one of the many sunset beaches, which was also bustling with people. And after the countdown and festivities, we took a nap and then we were off for another five hour drive to an event just outside Fort Lauderdale for the first light of 2024. The rest of the day, we just enjoyed camping at the ranch we were staying at near Tampa. But I tell you, community is everywhere, worldwide, and that is so cool. All right, so coming up in this lightning round of a smorgasbord episode, we've got so much geocaching news to ring in the new year of 2024, plus oodles of stories and adventures, community news, creative ideas, a day that will live in infamy, that mailbag submission from one Sir Tiny Tim, and of course, George has some input for a new geocache listing. <laughs> but first, let's dive in to review what's happening officially in geocaching from HQ. So next year marks the 25th year since geocaching began in May of 2000. Now in five year increments, HQ has run some form of celebratory bonus to the hobby. I began in 2009, but I think in 2005 they released a five year commemorative geocoin. In 2010, HQ held a lost and found event in Seattle. In 2015, HQ held a major block party in Seattle. And in 2020, give or take, <laughs> the 20 year celebrations met a hitch in the road with a pandemic on the loose. So the celebrations took a very different turn with special community celebrations, events held worldwide by the community. There were other bonuses with each celebration, of course, like more exclusive official swag and paraphernalia. But this time we are hit by the big quarter century. And similar to prior milestones, HQ is letting the world celebrate, but this time they're bringing back block parties and they can happen anywhere that there is a mega event. If you attend a mega event in 2025 and it has attained the official block party status from HQ, you'll earn that extremely rare block party icon for your stats. But more importantly, you'll have participated in one part of the worldwide celebrations of 25 years of geocaching. So take a look at that calendar or reach out to other events or start planning a vacation for next year or break out the notepad and start jotting down ideas, but start promoting and sharing the word about the hobby and see if you can help a local gathering become a mega and an official geocaching block party. Rolling back to this year, 2024 is one of those special one in four years, mostly, where we can get an extra day on our calendar. It's a leap year, meaning for geocachers, it's a very rare opportunity to get out and cash on that shy little date. <laughs> and if you really love numbers and statistics, to try to fill as many stats as possible on that one specific date. If you look at your profile stats for the date found grid, you'll see February 29th on there, and it's probably got a few less fines. Or maybe still at zero if you've only just started the hobby in the last four years. Thankfully, Project GC has a tool to help see what sort of geocaching you might want to set on the calendar for a Thursday with their Leap Day badge accomplishments for your stats view. You'll find the links in the show notes. There's a page listing all the badges you can earn and a stats checker you can run to find out how far along you are and what you'll need to find. Are you on the extreme and taking the day off, whatever you might otherwise be doing and making a whole day all about 229 caching? Comment, email, or call in and share your plans or adventures. HQ has also decided to make 2024 a little more fun for cache hiders and hopefully inspire some creative new geocaches. For each month of 2024, HQ is promoting a theme for new geocache hides. 
If you feel that creative itch, take up the challenge and hide a cache you've created with that month's theme. The announcement reads, We'd love to highlight all the memorable geocaches featured in the geocaching communities around the world. The question is, where to start? That's why we're introducing our monthly geocache hiding themes for all those cache owners who don't know where to begin when it comes to their newest cache creation. Each month, we'll highlight a handful of caches from that month's theme on the geocaching blog. Every theme is open to interpretation, so let your creativity flow. Just remember to follow the geocache hiding guidelines. There are themes for each month from January to December. Maybe at least one theme will really get your brain juices churning. Okay, that's a Nikki metaphor. <laughs> so in January, we've got books and libraries. In February, it's birdhouses. In March, it's plants and mushrooms. In April, colorful caches. In May, sports and video games. Mm. June, it's animals. For July, water and nautical. August, sneaky camouflage. September, pop culture. October, extra large caches. November, extreme terrain five caches. And December, the holidays. HQ has already highlighted a few new geocaches for January in their blog, so if you take up the challenge, be sure to contact them and they may feature your cache. But I like this idea because it's getting back to what geocaching is primarily about, finding actual physical geocaches and encouraging creativity. HQ has announced that they'll be taking another year break from the Geocaching International Film Festival, so no GIF in 2024. I guess that'll give filmmakers another year to plan and create or to get ideas, but it also means that in 2025, the year we celebrate 25 years of geocaching, GIF may just be a little bigger as well. I wonder what the GIF gnomes will be planning this time. The geocaching store, Shop Geocaching, has also just rolled out a new service that will allow you, on purchasing certain geocoins, to provide a custom engraving text. So now a lot of those uh, challenge and milestone geocoins have that little uh, block where, you know, there might be a tracking code, but now they've provided that and allow you to request things like uh, your geocaching username or a small text to go with that. They, they provide room for 35 characters on two lines. So that's 20 characters on the first and up to 15 on the second. And the additional fee is just $6 US. So if you want to really customize one of those geocoins for somebody, <laughs> then you can do that if you want. They might not be able to be traded or, or sold if you want to because now you've got a custom name on there. And that's not as special. We've got a fairly major update from uh, HQ on their logging flow. So if you use the website more than the mobile app, then you'll notice that the logging flow has been updated quite a lot. The visual appearance has changed significantly, but uh, primarily now you'll notice that that prior update from a while back where they were renaming needs maintenance to owner attention required and needs archive to reviewer attention required has finally been rolled out. So there's no more NM or NA logs, it's OR and RAR. <laughs> This is so that the log names more accurately reflect what these logs are actually doing. The logging flow applies to geocache logs and travel bug logs. And another functionality improvement now is you can pin a log date. So right next to the date entry field, there is now a pin that you can toggle. And then as you uh, say post multiple logs from a different date that's not today, you'll be able to keep that and not have it to keep entering the log date that you want for every single log. It'll just remember that as you enter all of them. The drop-down showing log types now shows all relevant log types for the, uh, for the geocache or travel bug, including the maintenance logs, which are now back in the list instead of seeing that little button for report a problem and choosing from a select list of options. So now we're back to what the needs maintenance log used to be, where you can now post an owner attention required log or a reviewer attention required log and put your own content in there describing it so that the owner will know exactly what the reasoning is. One thing to keep in mind is that those logs will always be posted as of the date that you post them, not the date that you enter for the log. So if you're logging caches from a week ago and you also include a, an OR log, then the OR will appear as posted today while your find log or DNF or whatever will be posted as of a week ago. The text entry for, uh, for the log text has received some formatting updates 
and the size of the text input has been increased to 5,000 characters instead of 4,000. I, I don't know who, like, do you write logs that long? <laughs> I think I've only, in my, since 2009, all of my caching career, I've only written a handful of logs that have been more than one log length. And that was because it was just a fantastic whole expedition to find this amazing cache, and it ends up being a long story that spans over two or three logs. And uh, those seem to be kind of common for those major geocaches, but... I, have you had problems hitting uh, hitting that 4,000 character max and are you going to make use of 5,000? And I don't mean for upping your average log length count in your statistics. Ugh. <laughs> uh, image uploading has also received an overhaul. Uh, there's still a few bugs that are being tweaked, but when the update rolled out, it was an, they had initially limited uploads to 5 meg. They have now updated it to 10 meg after so much pushback that 5 meg was barely enough for any kind of small photo uploaded from modern smartphones. They're, they tend to be way more than 5 meg on average. And they've also limited the number of images per log to 20. Uh, but now on upload, you can also rotate your images. And some people have found that if you've got that weird uh, bug where the image on display isn't rotated properly, then you can use that rotation and it'll fix that whole mismatched rotation. Um, but the upload process itself has is a lot more user-friendly, which is great. The option to encrypt logs has also been removed. I guess they, they have probably have statistics about that and barely anybody uses it anymore, so... Now, you generally won't be able to hide potential spoilers behind encrypted logs. It was just really a way to stop people from accidentally reading something that they didn't want to read if you thought that it might be a spoiler for the cache. And owners are now required to give details about why a log on a travel bug or geocache has been deleted. Uh, so before, they could just delete and you wouldn't... I think you got a notification, but you weren't told why. So now they're required to explain why they're deleting your log. There's a few other updates that had been rolled out with this significant overhaul, uh, but those were the major ones. So I don't know how you feel about those updates. Do you think these are better or worse? Or do you like them? Do you hate them? Are they irrelevant? I'd love to hear it. So email tgif at cashtheline.net and let me know. The Adventures app has received a couple of notable updates over the new year as well. Firstly, they added the ability for you to share your adventure completions with a special postcard image that captures the essence of the adventure with your accomplishment. A souvenir style thing to share and helps to bring others into that segment of the hobby as well. It's a neat idea that wraps up the adventure in a really postcard-like graphic and you can even choose the stamp design you want to save with the card. Your past adventure postcards can also be viewed in a collection with the Adventures app. I've always been a fan for digital rewards for things, and if you don't like them, you can ignore them, right? <laughs> Farewell, mes amis. Remember back in 2018 when HQ decided to conduct a technological experiment and permit the use of a few mobile augmented reality apps in the creation of field puzzles for mystery caches? Well, they proliferated for a time, and as the technology evolved, slowly the approved apps dwindled and fell out of support or just killed off. But quite a few AR geocaches around the world still lingered on, whether by use of alternate puzzles to attain coordinates or perhaps altered sources for the AR game. Well, the gong has rung, and HQ, as of February 9th, 2024, has decided to end support for AR geocaches. At least for now. All caches flagged as AR geocaches received this note posted by GCHQ. From June 6, 2018 until March 6, 2019, Geocaching HQ conducted an augmented reality AR experiment. During that time, cache owners were allowed to submit mystery caches that require the finder to download and use an AR app to find the cache. The goal of the experiment was to see how the geocaching community would use AR technology. Cache owners placed more than 600 AR caches around the world. Unfortunately, the AR apps which met HQ's requirements for the experiment have been or are currently in the process of being discontinued. As a result, it is currently not possible for finders to have the AR experience that was originally intended. Therefore, HQ has decided to archive all active AR caches placed during the experiment period. 
we are respectfully requesting that all AR cache owners please remove the cache container and contents as soon as possible. As technology evolves, we look forward to seeing how augmented reality might have future applications for geocaching. Thank you to all cache owners who participated in the experiment. You know, I really do hope to see AR caches make a comeback once their support and accessibility has grown. The tech is becoming more common and supported in web browsers on mobile web pages without the need for third-party downloads. So as that front improves, maybe in time we'll see them return. I'd love to recreate my own AR cache, which had you peering through your phone's portal to a movie marquee sign at the nearby theater to see hidden geocaching-themed movies and times. It was a really cool way to interact with the world. But for now, farewell mes amis. I don't know why I'm saying that in French. <laughs> Another round of virtual reward cash listings are rolling out. Last summer, HQ announced Virtual Rewards 4.0, and this time they included a new qualification that you must have hidden a geocache in 2023, which earned at least four favorite points on it, in order to opt in for the new draw to receive a virtual cache listing to publish in this round. Now, I don't publish caches all that often, so sadly I jumped the gun with a new night cache that I published in late 2022, and I barely got another cash out the door at the end of December 2023, which just wasn't enough time to earn the favorite points needed to qualify. Bah! But I'm looking forward to seeing what other new locations will get highlighted by all of the new virtuals that should be getting published soon. Some people don't like that they keep giving more away to create, but I think it's a great way to highlight the game board we're walking on, especially if there are other physical geocaches to find nearby. Now let's take a look at upcoming mega events for the next month. Not surprisingly, with one special day coming up, there seems to have been a lot of planning. We've got three mega events, each on February 29th. If you're in Texas, look up GCACQBJ, or GeoLeap 2024. And that's it for North America, but if you're in Australia, look up GCA1DNA, The Great Leap Forward. And last, but certainly not least, you could head to Germany for GC80WK0 for, um, uh, let's let Google Translate say it. Treffen sich mehrere. Am 29. Februar 2024. You know, I think that would be a great stat to achieve. Attend a mega event on Leap Day. If you're near one, maybe it's worth making the trek to attend. Coming up, we're going to go diving into some goal setting for geocaching in 2024. This is TGIF Geocaching Radio. Have you ever gone looking for a difficult cache and got so fed up that you decided to resort to that oh-so-dreaded PAF, phone a friend, to see if you can get a tip? And then you check the log history and see loads of people you don't know or people you'd prefer not to ask for a tip and wish you could just see logs from your friends? Well, if you've already added your friends' geocaching accounts as friends to yours, and you can do that by visiting their profile either in the official app or on the website, then Cashly has the answer. When you're looking at the cache details within Cashly, tap the logs section to load all of the latest logs. If you're in such a rush that you don't want to scroll through and skim, let alone visit the cache's webpage listing, you can filter the logs automatically. In the upper right, tap the circular avatar button and you'll see two options for viewing logs, my logs and friends logs. While the rest is self-explanatory. <laughs> Maybe you're actually helping a friend, but you want to get quickly to your own log from two years ago. Filtering the log list by my logs will show only the logs of every type, including DNFs, that were posted to the cache by yourself. Then you can read and refresh your memory to your heart's content, and maybe you could help your friend earn their own smiley. Thanks to Cashly for sponsoring this episode. It is my go-to geocaching app, and I'd say the best on iOS by far. It's unsurpassed by any other geocaching app in features and quality, and the app alone is worth a few bucks for its features. I highly recommend this app, whether you're a veteran geocacher or just starting out in the hobby. Find it in the App Store or by visiting www.cashly.com. C-A-C-H-L-Y.com.
well, 2025 is a milestone for geocaching, but 2024 is also a milestone for Earth caches. Yep, this year we are celebrating 20 years since Earth caches became a thing. The first Earth cache was placed January 10th, 2004, called Earth Cache 1, a simple geology tour of Wasphead. It was published in New South Wales and Australia by GeoAware. And that cache is GCHFT2. The owner's name, GeoAware, has become the uh, naming convention of Earth Cache reviewers, too. But the original GeoAware, Gary Lewis, I had the privilege of sitting down to interview about Earth Caches for the online only CacheCon event in 2021. It was great to hear from Gary, and you can see that interview on YouTube with the link in the show notes. I'd be remiss if I didn't share a couple of my favorite Earth Caches to date. I feel like one that must be highlighted is the Eternal Flame Earth Cache just south of Buffalo in New York. This is a small touristy type of attraction at a little waterfall in Chestnut Ridge Park, but it takes a short hike to get to and you need to find your way down into a ravine to backtrack along the stream and reach the waterfall from below. And there you'll find a tiny cavern under the cascade. Recessed inside is a very slight crack, but it's a hole that goes deep into the earth where a thin breath of natural gas escapes and is just enough for a flame to be lit and keep lit safely, even to the point that if a visitor arrives and it's blown out, they can take a match or lighter and relight this natural fire. Of course, depending on how much water or ice there is on your visit, you might get pretty wet. But it's quite a sight and worth the visit to earn that earth cache smiley. And that cache is GC10VMY. But another favorite one that was just a fantastic adventure was an earth cache I logged in Scotland during my UK visit at the top of Ben Nevis. That's the tallest mountain in the UK, with the next highest reportedly in Norway. But that day hike to reach the peak was rewarded by a physical cache, a virtual cache, and the earth cache Ben Nevis Ring of Fire. That's GC161P6. Also, we held an event around brunch time after an early morning departure from the trailhead. Fresh cooked up breakfast with our host Hill Gorilla and a bunch of other geocachers who were in the UK for the UK Mega Event. That was back in 2019. That was an amazing five terrain experience. Unfortunately, the weather was a little foggy at the top, but hiking up and down through the clouds and seeing the view through the gaps was just fantastic. You can watch the video from that hike I published on YouTube at cachetheline.net slash Ben Nevis as part of a UK mega travel caching series. Linked, as always, in the show notes. <laughs> anyway, that's the kind of earth cache I can get behind. Not just a simple question look up at a signpost, and not just educational, but man, if it didn't provide an experience as well. Those deserve the favorite points for sure. And I have three earth caches published to date myself, and two are at just absolutely beautiful locations that I encourage you to get into and experience. <laughs> what will you be doing to celebrate 20 years of Earth Caches? It can be a lot of work to create one, but it doesn't have to be complicated. And honestly, a lot of people really prefer the simpler ones and hate extra homework, says the guy with a five difficulty, one terrain homework required Earth Cache. <laughs> So just recently, in late January, you may have noticed, if you're lucky to live near one, that many mob geocaches have been or are getting archived or disabled. A mob cache, if you don't know what it is, is a sort of field puzzle cache. In order to attain the geocache coordinates, a mob of a certain number of geocachers has to gather at the required coordinates while using their smartphone with GPS enabled and visiting a website which tracks live how many people it senses are physically at that location. The owner can set how many people are required, but that's how you get the mob. Oodles of geocachers working together and lingering at the coordinates until the website hits the threshold and unlocks the final coordinates for all. They can be great fun, but it's not a simple function to program safely and privately and fairly and requires a dedicated website to track connections. Well, it seems the developer of this web tool, uh, Chilihead, has, after all these years, shut down the website. He says... It's lasted longer than I expected, but the poor choice of implementation on my side was causing some issues on the server side off and on. Rather than fix it, I decided to retire this fun experiment about eight years after I thought I would retire it. Thanks to all who played with it and created their own, 
After retiring it, I found out that there were many more out there than I had expected, and I apologize for the sudden retirement. You can read more about this in the forum post linked in the show notes. Suffice to say, I think it was a popular enough concept that at least one replacement will appear and possibly be made use of. So thanks to Chilihead for creating his tool and opening it for public use for much longer than eight years. There are other tools out there, other mob caches that use their own websites, but this was a big one, and caches that no longer work may have already been archived by reviewers. I believe that stopped in the hopes that a new tool will be released by someone and approved for use by Geocaching HQ. One thing's for sure, and I'm calling it, this is not the end of mob caches. They shall return. Oh yes, they shall return. So on a prior episode, I had talked about how to quickly and cashly make a bucket list of locations you may come across to see if there's caches there that you might want to find in the future. And uh, so this month, I came across a reel that was posted on Facebook, and it's uh, a rather kind of a long documentary about what happened to the USS Arizona during the attack on Pearl Harbor. And so I just got so fascinated by uh, the video that they shared about all the detail about how the ship works and all the components of the ship and how it was attacked and all that. And it led to um, this location that is the memorial of the, the resting of the USS Arizona in the bay in Hawaii at Pearl Harbor. And so out of curiosity, I went to the map and I checked out that location, we headed over to Pearl Harbor and looked to see if there were caches. And sure enough, there is a geocache there. It is called a date which will live in infamy. And so this geocache is a puzzle cache. Interestingly, I did not know this, but the memorial is in the harbor next to Ford Island in Pearl Harbor. But you can only get to this memorial by a shuttle boat off of the coast at the uh, Pearl Harbor National Memorial. This is a very, some would say, sacred site. And so that reel talks about its construction and uh, the meaning behind, say, the the count of the windows and the patterns and whatnot. But uh, yeah, so I found this cache. It is GC914VG. And it also has an adventure lab to go with it. And that Adventure Lab is a standard five-stage lab which starts off at the National Memorial where, from where you would take the shuttle over to the memorial off the shore where the Arizona sits and resides. What's really cool about that is the, the remnants of the ship are still there and you can look down through the glass and see the ship and what remains. And I think that's pretty cool. And so I thought, uh, I thought I would just highlight that as a little adventure. I'm, that is on my bucket list. I'm, that's something, if I ever get to Honolulu, I think that Pearl Harbor itself is a great tourist destination to uh, take a look around and just appreciate what happened. But um, there is a geocache for your bucket list, a date which will live in infamy. There is a massive, widely spread series of geocaches, a very extensive geocaching adventure that's nationwide across the United States. This has been around since 2006, and you just may never have heard of it. But this series, Cache Across America, has attracted travelers and adventurers for years. And if you love stats, this series is for you. And if you're trying to find a geocache in every U.S. state, this series of caches is another to add to the find in whatever state list sort of like the goal of finding every state's oldest active geocache. According to the website, the series was created in 2006 by Blue Power Ranger. All of the 50 state caches in the series have individual owners who maintain the cache in their respective state. The first geocaches to complete the series and be first to find on the series final were Z Steve and Hopper Z. They completed the series on May 26, 2007, and to date, 51 geocachers have completed the series. The series final, GC12E08, is maintained for Cache Across America by geocacher Flying Moose. Since the final cache is very seldom visited, please contact him before taking your journey to find it. And there are rewards for completing the series. It continues, In addition to the immense joy of finishing this monumental feat, you will receive one geocoin and two patches to commemorate your accomplishment. You will also have the distinct privilege of having your photo proudly displayed on the Cash Across America Hall of Fame. (laughs) Maybe you've already completed the series, but if not, perhaps you should consider adding this series to your traveling bucket list. 
My bigger question is, what might it take to create a Cash Across Canada series? Actually, you know, there is already a series that will take you to a cache in the capital cities of most of the Canadian provinces and territories. There are only 11 caches in this series rather than the 50 in the U.S., but hey, our provinces are much bigger than the states, so we've got that. (laughs) It was created in 2006, and it's called the Great White North Geotour, and the final cache is in the nation's capital, Ottawa. There have been some replacement caches over the years, but the series is alive and kicking. Since 2006, to date, there have been 15 logged finds on this series finale. Only 15. That final cache is GCYK96, and you can find that link and a bookmark list of all the series caches in the show notes, as well as the website and information for the Cache Across America series at geocachingcentral.com. Well, we're back to another rare year. It's a leap year, and that means we've got the coveted February 29th date and another opportunity to fill that grid square with loads of statistics in our geocaching career profile. Now, looking at your basic GC profile stats, there's only a year grid for number of finds on specific dates. But, thanks to Project GC, we can take a look at most every angle of our stats just for that specific date. Thanks to Hugh, a script writer in the Project GC community, there is a challenge checker available, though not linked to any challenge cache, which rolls through all of the badges that Project GC awards for your statistical accomplishments, but only those specific to earn on February 29th. If you visit that checker, the link in the show notes, and enter your geocaching username, you'll be given a full list of geocaching activities and stats you can try to complete on February 29th to earn badges. If you want to take that one in, uh, what's what's 365 times four? <laughs> one in 1,460 day opportunity to make a day of it? Better get over to that checker and start planning your day of geocaching. And as mentioned earlier, if you're anywhere near one of the three mega events happening that day, that might be a top priority. How rare would it be to attend not just an event, but a mega event on Leap Day? Does that entice you, Stats Hound? (laughs) Alright, speaking of goals and accomplishments, I thought I'd run through a few ideas that crossed my browsing since last show. Maybe new, maybe old, but I found a little bit intriguing and challenging. First off, you've heard of charter members, or if you haven't, those are the geocaching users who began their account in the first few years of geocaching up to March 2003. That is a long time. (laughs) There are still quite a few charter members around, some still actively geocaching and hiding geocaches. One challenge people like is to find at least one geocache by every active charter member but there are a number of charter member type challenges, and a few are available in a bookmark list that's linked in the show notes. But another twist on that charter member challenge is one sort of like finding the oldest cache in each region. But for charter members, there's a spreadsheet of all geocaches placed by charter members from June 21st, 2000 to a breakfast event on February 29th, 2024. From that spreadsheet, you could try to find as many of the oldest caches placed by each charter member. Or you could just use another bookmark list being maintained that shows the oldest active cache of each charter member. Show notes! (laughs) From that list, I can see that I have one more charter member's oldest cache left to find in Ontario out of six available. But there are oldest charter member caches all over the world, so wherever you're listening from, there may be another candidate target or few near you, and go check it out. I don't know about you, but here in Ontario, the challenge cache landscape is insane. We have numerous very prolific geocaches, and they're always vying for higher stats and well-rounded stats. So while most people in the world are sort of just working towards completing one Jasmer or fizzy grid, we have challenges requiring multiple loops. And to date, as many as up to, well, as of December, one requiring a Fizzy of fizzies. 81 complete fizzy grids. In all of Canada right now, there's only 15 geocachers who qualify. Worldwide, it really opens up, mainly from the USA and Germany. But nonetheless, that's just through the roof. Regardless of whether you think the difficulties and terrains people use to qualify are accurate experiences or not. 
Well, some of these extreme variations of basic stat challenges are just fantasies for the 99.9% of us, but one variation that can help bring them back down to earth is going back to requiring the simpler task, but within the bounds of local counties. Most numbers hounds do a whole lot of traveling to find the variety of caches they do, but the chance of merely completing a basic stat like that in very limited region boundaries really helps bring everyone back to an even level. And a great challenge to demonstrate this is to complete, say, one full DT grid inside a single county. That may, of course, lead people to the few counties where there may be cache series that cover an entire DT grid, or counties with a good variety of DTs, but while you may have 10 complete grids from finding caches across the province and many counties, that alone won't qualify. Thankfully, there is a checker once again created by the illustrious Hugh at Project GC, which will show for you a breakdown of all your DT grids found in each country across Canada and the USA. So check out your own stats. How many complete fizzy grids in distinct counties have you found? Is that even a statistic if you like traveling that you feel like trying to boost? <laughs> for me, as of right now, the checker shows I've got six complete county fizzy grids. Unsurprisingly, in counties all around my home. How about you? Making the rounds on social media are bookmark lists of the top favorited caches in various regions, which have over 1,000 favorite points. HQ even highlighted this challenge on their blog. How many geocaches with over 1,000 favorite points have you found? There's an easy way to find out what these caches are. If you navigate to the search page, you can sort any results by the number of favorite points awarded. So sort in descending order and you can see how many have over a thousand. Or filter down to specific regions. Get those on a target bookmark list and start flipping those icons to smileys. <laughs> Typically, there's good reason why those caches have earned over a thousand favorites. So not only would you be completing the statistic, you'd also be treated to a whole load of potentially most excellent geocaching adventures. There's a new feature on Project GC's profile statistics page. It's a difficulty terrain grid, but showing the oldest cache age of each DT that you found. It's the fizzy grid, but using the oldest finds for each DT. When you're viewing your profile stats on Project GC, on the finds tab, scroll down to oldest by DT. And for instance, if you found Mingo, a GC30, the oldest active geocache, then your DT11 grid spot should have the most number of days old in your grid. One challenge you could work towards is increasing your average DT age. Or search for the oldest active geocache of every DT combination, like the Jasmer for placed months, but for difficulty terrain combinations. I feel like placing a challenge cache that requires reaching a sum total of days for the entire grid. That can be nice and flexible because you have 81 options to try to find older caches and increase the count towards qualifying. A neat side effect is that uh, every day you work on the challenge, your sum total would be increasing by 81, or uh, plus one day uh, up to however many DTs you have found already. You could qualify after a bunch of years without geocaching at all. <laughs> okay, maybe that could disqualify this challenge concept, but man, I gotta look into this one. My youngest, oldest DT cache, <laughs> that's the lowest age count on the grid, was placed on June 24th, 2007. And my oldest, four and a half difficulty and one terrain find, and the youngest on the grid. Aren't statistics fun? <laughs> How's your grid looking? Okay, while we're on statistics, this next one may seem a little more complicated, but a good tool to help find quality caches. It had me working for a while trying to f fully grasp what it means, so bear with me as I try to explain this new metric. Firstly, as mentioned earlier, favorite points are often used to gauge great geocaches, but what about places that have low population? They may have fantastic geocaches, but very few geocachers, so may never earn over, say, a thousand favorite points, let alone a hundred. On the flip side, some regions may have thousands of geocachers or tourists ruling, rolling through, giving, say, a relatively mundane cache at an airport thousands of favorites for personal reasons, and not really indicative of a great one to seek out for the geocache experience. Okay, so then how about percentage of favorite points given uh, relative to the number of finds? It's a little better, except that favorite points can only be given by premium members, so it's still a little weighted for regions that have more basic members than premium members. And so great caches in those latter areas may miss out. The percent is still interesting, but in a place with, say, 100 geocaches where only two are premium members, 
If they both give a favorite point each, but no one else did, that would still show a 100% favorite point rate, when that may not be accurate at all, because it implies that the other 98 geocachers would all give one as well if they could. Unlikely. So the issue, it seems, is that the favorite points alone metrics are all based on the finder's opinions, and after they find it, limited to a small relative group of them, the premium members, and don't really take into consideration the cash owner's hiding reputation. And that could also serve as a very, very good indicator of a geocache's potential quality and whether it's up, whether it's worth targeting to find. So now, Project GC has created a tool that can calculate what's called the H-index rating. And this H-index rating balances the finder's ratings with the quality and quantity of a cache hider's history. It's a number that does a good job of putting prolific cache hiders on the same playing field as rare hiders and hiders with high favorite points and cachers who are just getting started. So, in one example, a cache with 1,000 favorites hidden by someone with 1,000 finds won't get a rating of 1,000, but neither will they if that's their only hide. It seems kind of odd or unfair, but it's a way to reduce those kind of blips to, to a uh, more generic, generally balanced quality and quantity. So a short way to describe the number, if I get this right, your H index rating would be the highest value where the number of hides with that favorite point count is less than that favorite point count. <laughs> For example, if you have 16 hides with 18 favorites each, your rating would be 16. Even if you have two more with 17 favorite points, which would be 18 hides with 17 favorite points, that doesn't give you an 18 rating. One effect of this rating is that if you hide loads of mundane caches that may only earn one or two points over time, that could potentially hinder a higher H index rating. Or if you have three hides with 50 points, your rating would be three, not 50, even if you have another 17 hides with 10 points, because the rating options would be 3 with 50 points, or 20 with 10 points, so only 3 is less than 50. <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, it's crazy to wrap your head around how, uh, how the rating works, but in so many words, if you see a high rating, it means that as an owner, your favorite point earning curve is well-rounded, regardless of how many you've hidden, and people will have a very good chance at having a great experience finding one of your caches. And that ultimately is what people tend to be looking for when they're seeking out highly favorited caches. So next time you search for high favorite point caches, run the tool that Project GC provides that tells you the cache owner's H index rating. And the way I interpret it would be that one, a high owner rating is a good thing. Two, a cache with a high favorite point count close to the owner's rating is also a good thing. And three, a newer cache with a low favorite count owned by a cacher with a high rating may stand a good chance of actually being good. On the flip side, a cache with a thousand favorites by an owner with a low rating might still be great, but it might also just be a blip, like that mundane cache at the airport. <laughs> Ultimately, this H index rating for cache ownership gives you one more metric to decide how you want to interpret favorite point counts and percentages. For me, my rating appears to be 16, because I've got 16 caches with at least 16 favorite points. I don't have 17 caches with 17 favorite points. <laughs> that makes a little more sense. By the H index checker on Project GC, link in the show notes, it places me in about mid 6,000th place worldwide. And the user with the highest H index is, uh, well, in Germany, and <laughs> looks like it's a team of 15 geocachers that likely puts out many series of high quality commissioned geocaches. Their rating of 131 means that 131 of their 1,263 hides has at least 131 favorite points. That's Germany, man, I tell you. All right, enough of the complicated mumbo jumbo. Just run the checker and see how your rating does. <laughs> You know, I often ramble off a little scripted segment about supporting Cash the Line and this podcast through Patreon, but with the beginning of the year 2024, I just wanted to say something a little different. I'm sincerely grateful to all of you who opt in to support the channel, the podcast, and brand. It really is a lot of work to put together content, whether it's video or audio or events, or even helping to promote the hobby over social media. And there are so many people in this community now who really help to provide an amazing network of connected geocachers and content providers 
from bloggers and vloggers, photographers, travelers, podcasters, to just standout personalities, like the illustrious Joshua, the geocaching vlogger. <laughs> but it's thanks to those of you who support in whatever way you're able, whether financially, through kind words of encouragement, through sharing content and interacting, answering questions, and helping others in the community that keep us going, who give us motivation to keep creating, or just help to fund the costs and time and equipment needed to produce entertaining, promotional, and engaging content. I really do hope that you enjoy what Cache the Line creates and stands for, and if you would like to join the growing band of excellent geocaching adventurers who pitch in to help keep the ball rolling here, just visit patreon.com slash cache the line, where you'll find a few options for contributions from as little as the cost of a cup of coffee per month to annual support with a bonus discount and see what other bonuses you may receive and unlock as a thank you for your generosity. And now, just as announced earlier, every patron will be receiving those special signature stickers of Tiny Tim and Sir Maximus. So visit patreon.com slash cash the line for all the details, and thank you so, so much for your support. Time to move on to some fun stories from the geocaching community. Firstly, here is a very cool discovery and something cache owners could really consider when making geoart. Troy Yoner wrote about his experience completing an Alien Head geoart series, saying, Went for a walk in Nevada really close to Area 51. I activated my watch to track all my steps. When I was done, what I found was amazing. I added images so you can see what transpired. I'm not saying I'm a believer, but the steps don't lie. <laughs> Since you can't see what he found here, check out the show notes for the link to his post. Until then, here is a spoiler. Walking to each cache, he was walking to each cache in the desert, in sequential order, meant that his GPS track log traced out a perfectly creepy alien head. No crossing lines or paths, just like the GeoArt. He finished, I love GeoArt and I hope to explore more. <laughs> I never actually thought of finding caches in a geoart in order like that before. It does help that it's a hike series over an open field and probably isn't the most optimal route to find them all, but still a very cool idea by the cache owner. The first cache in the series, Head Alien number 01, is GC253ZN. Check it out on the map. Once you learn about some of the most common challenges, like completing a fizzy or a DT grid, it can be really hard to ignore the temptation to finish it. The Jasmer is another great one, but it's a naturally harder one because the oldest caches tend to be the most likely to get archived. But thanks to enthusiastic geocachers, often the oldies get saved from extinction. Then their legacy can continue and people can still work towards a great achievement. Doug Steven shared a nice occurrence saying, A cacher from Austria visiting the Seattle area recently logged a couple of my adopted caches to complete their Jasmer. I'm happy that I was able to adopt and maintain those 2004 era caches to further that goal. Just like another friend of mine, they were able to complete their Jasmer grid in just two years. I'm still six away after 14 years. <laughs> Maybe Doug didn't need this particular cache, but there is one downfall to adopting a cache you hadn't found yourself first. You won't be able to log it yourself if you need it for a challenge. <laughs> Hopefully Doug already found a cache placed in the same month as this one. Pro tip, if you want to adopt a cache to keep it going, find and log it first, then work with its owner to adopt it and keep it alive. Even better if the oldie geocache provides an excellent geocaching adventure. I recently received a communique from our good friend, one Sir Tiny Tim. You may be familiar with him and the treasure troops at Cache Line HQ from prior years Geovlogmas and Geopodmas miniseries. Last we heard from him, he'd just been promoted after his team saved him from being lost in the cash line dimension forever. <laughs> his actions earned him a spot that Sir Maximus had prepared for him, taking on the role and responsibilities that he had previously filled in the treasure troops. Geovlogmus followed me and Tiny Tim on our traveling adventures and mishaps, and Geopodmus followed Tiny Tim after he returned to CLHQ. If you'd like to catch up on all that's happened, here's the description from the full video and audio playlist linked in the show notes. Strange things are afoot, and while out vlogging some special Christmas-themed geocaching videos, I met a little guy I called Tiny Tim, who accompanied me on some adventures and helped with giveaways. In the course of this journey, though, I discovered a new hidden dimension with powers and abilities I had no idea existed, seemingly energized by geocaching. And that led me down a rabbit hole which hasn't yet closed. 
Well, it seems this year the Treasure Troops have been facing some difficulties themselves at CLHQ. And here's what Tiny Tim wrote to people who helped support the Cash Line Artifact project on Indiegogo. Friends, I come to you bearing warm wishes and greetings for this season. It's been a woof Christmas. Uh, I mean, rough Christmas. Because we at HQ have been having occasional problems with our portal network. Lily has been hard at work with her team of technicians trying to track down why we get odd blips in the signal that can cause some of our troops to appear at very inconvenient locations when arriving at geocaches to restock with items. The cloud, that's what we're calling the CLD now, seems to be getting a little, how can I describe it, cloudy. The lines the portals traverse in the dimension are having a difficult time keeping on target we think, or perhaps there's something about trajectory or speed that's being affected by what we can only visualize as a sort of staticky haze. HQ has developed some new technology that allows our portals to see through to the other end of its current line. It's how we've been able to create those imprint discs you have included in your artifact shipments. We've really seen some amazing locations and inspirational images that we can only imagine have helped to strengthen the lines that traverse the cloud as people continue to successfully find the things they're searching for. Thankfully, the noise in the portal signals hasn't been significant enough to cause any havoc or imminent danger to our treasure troops, but we're still working to solve this mystery at the mainframe around the clock. So if you notice anything on your end, especially once you receive your artifacts, please do remember to report your findings back to CLHQ. Now, on a much brighter note, I want to thank you and all the troops for your well wishes. I was recently humbled by being presented with a special gift made in my and our honorable predecessor, Sir Maximus's likenesses. My wonderful friends here went out of their way to make stickers in our honor. They tell me that they have made extras, enough to give to the helpful patrons of Cash the Line for all the support they provide. I've been asked to request that they be included in the shipments to the patrons. I hope that smiles light your path and may the line lead you on. Yours woofly, Sir Tiny Tim. So it looks like Tim's been running around hectic trying to figure out that disruption in the CLD signal at CLHQ. Hopefully it doesn't interfere with the treasure troops' travels while they carry out their duties. But like he wrote, I have received a small shipment of memorabilia, stickers of Sir Maximus and Sir Tiny Tim that'll be inserted in all the artifact orders placed by patrons of Cash the Line as a bonus. Thank you for supporting the channel and podcast. Good idea, treasure troops, and thanks. <laughs> by the way, there's still some coins available for purchase from the first batch ordered from the launch campaign. So if you're thinking about ordering these geocoins, aka the Cash Line artifacts, Please visit the campaign homepage at cashtheline.net slash artifact and check out the project. There is so much more yet to come. Scott Jones in Minnesota shared an exciting achievement he made, posting, I love hunting lonely caches, and this cache, GC29EW7, was just two months short of being 11 years lonely. It was published in 2010 and has only been found 10 times in almost 14 years. It's been 3,956 days since it has been found. I couldn't believe it was dry and in an amazing shape. Incredible. You know, it's one thing finding a lonely cache that just hasn't been found in a long time. It's another to find a lonely cache that isn't found much at all, especially in a region where there's a decent-sized community or sizable selection of caches to find. That cache Scott found is not far off the beaten path in Wisconsin, so it's kind of surprising it has such a lonely history. So good on you, and congrats for finding it and proving that it's still alive. Lonely, lonely, no more. <laughs> Geocaching cruises are really trending these days. They ain't cheap, but wow, do they provide a fantastic experience for geocachers. Not only do you get the experience of a cruise, but typically these trips are planned by geocachers who start out an itinerary for finding geocaches at every location the cruise visits. That means grabbing caches in new countries and experiencing the local culture a little different than someone who might just be there for the touristy thrills. Well, Donovan Hagarty shared a little experience that gave him another memorable rush from the fun of this hobby. He shared, Our original cruise to the Bahamas was diverted to Labadee, Haiti, due to severe thunderstorm weather in the Bahamas. Labadee, Haiti did not disappoint at all. Prior to leaving Fort Lauderdale in Florida, we saved our Bahamas and Nassau caches offline. Then, while out to sea, the cruise captain said over the intercom that the ship will be diverting to Labadee, Haiti instead. I was like, oh, no, I had no offline caches saved for Haiti. 
I was bummed. I opted to buy the cruise ship internet package and immediately checked to see if there was at least one cache in Haiti. It was so awesome to see that Haiti had a cache placed here for us to find. Traveling all the way from Hawaii to find it. GC8D0 Cruise Cache, Labadee Beach. Now, whether you think vacation caches are a good thing for this hobby or not, there's certainly nothing more fulfilling than finding a geocache during an unexpected emergency and, in a way, marking that memory itself. I have a few caches that mark an event during my travels, which they'll always remind me of. Kind of like on a long road trip and you pop a tire. While waiting around, you may as well check to see if there's a cache nearby. And if there is, never forget that geocache is where I blew my tire. <laughs> Around Christmas, Mark Beer shared a little bit of an entertaining happenstance encountered while trying to spread some cheer. It's not specifically geocaching related, but shared by a geocacher who trades a lot of path tags by mail. And here's what Mark shared. My wife and I decided a month ago that there just wasn't enough Christmas cheer anymore. It's not like it used to be where the air was literally filled with good cheer among people whenever the holidays rolled around. And we thought to change that, so we let our children pick out 10 random towns across the U.S. from an atlas. Then we used Google Maps to find a street in that town that had multiple houses on it. To those houses, we sent Christmas cards filled with confetti and glitter and a little message saying they had been randomly selected for some much-needed Christmas cheer. Okay, I have to interrupt. You can sense what's coming, right? <laughs> well, we mailed out 79 cards. No big deal, right? Well, this Saturday, I received a phone call from a California number, and thinking it was spam, I answered it, and they claimed to be the FBI. Well, I chuckled to myself and continued to play along until he mentioned an incident in Spring Hope, Utah, which is one of the towns we mailed to, where a woman received a card labeled Someone Special, and when she opened it, she must have inhaled some glitter and called the hazmat team in to check on her due to respiratory distress and this mysterious card. Let's just say I had to explain to him our plan, where we sent them all to, what we put in them, etc. He found out we were not being malicious or intended any harm, and chuckled a bit about our project. Moral of the story, no good deed goes unpunished, lol. <laughs> not even at Christmas. Now we wait for 78 more calls from the FBI, lol. <laughs> you no, know, random mailings are probably never a good idea in this day and age. Lesson learned. I hope Mark talked about geocaching to the FBI agent and got them hooked on the hobby too. <laughs> Katie Reed shared an experience she had when she received a geocoin by mail. It's a memorial geocoin for a puppy named Shadow who passed away in 2020. She said, I love personal coins and this one led me to an amazing geocache in the UK. Definitely the biggest I have ever seen here. The geocoin she got was made, quote, for my shadow who is always by my side. The tracking code leads to the trackable's homepage with more information, and on one side of the coin is an illustration of shadow, but on the other side is a drawing of a trail leading to a cave-like structure hiding a treasure chest. But over the opening is written, Open Sesame with a GC code. Hmm, talk about a tease. <laughs> I had to look it up. You can find the GC code in the show notes. I know now I'm a tease. <laughs> and it leads to what may be the biggest cache in the UK. There must be a backstory to this connection, but I'd like to think perhaps there was significance to that location for Shadow and his owner. Suffice to say, the trail and treasure chest cave don't seem to be reminiscent of the geocache it directs you to, but it's definitely a cache that looks worth finding if you're in the UK. Props to that geocoin creator for the idea, and a fun way to help your pup's memory live on. All right, here is a little feel-good item. Patricia Elkins shared this deep thought that I think stands on its own. She writes, People often ask, what do you get when we tell our tales of finding geocaches? It's the hardest thing to explain that we don't get anything. But we do get time spent together as friends. We get time outdoors, enjoying all the greatness this world has to offer. We get to travel the back roads and unknown places around us that the average person doesn't get to see. We get to meet other people like us who enjoy the simple things. We get newfound friends who share this dorky hobby. We get our feet wet and muddy. We get sticker burrs and sticks in our pockets. We get to act like young kids again at little out of the way parks. We get to see bald eagles and ducks and geese and mice and cows. 
lots of cows, and sometimes we even get to be the first to find on a well-hidden geocache and get the honor of putting our moniker on that sometimes damp piece of paper just saying we were there first. We get so much by not getting anything at all. Here, here. Thanks for those inspiring words, Patricia. How would you answer that question about geocaching? What do you get? So I also wanted to highlight a little bit of creativity in the geocaching realm this episode, and a few items were brought to my attention. So let's lightning through them. The Worldwide Cache Hide Challenge is back. If you recall last time, a challenge was put forth to the global community to hide pirate-themed geocaches and help spice up the geocaching game board. While it's making a comeback, but this round, it's Operation Superheroes. Your task, should you choose to accept it, is to create a geocache that is superhero-themed in some way, place it, and prepare it to publish, but it must be published on April 28th, or National Superhero Day, at 8 a.m. There's an infographic image to include in the listing so people know it's part of the series. If you become part of this effort, you'll be given a special badge image you'll be able to add to your public profile page and show off to your friends. If you host an event to help promote the effort, you'll also be given a badge to show on your profile. For all the details, including cash theme guidelines, support merch, example containers, and other community promotions, visit the homepage at geocachingcentral.com and find the link. Or just check the show notes for the link. Thanks to the deadliest cachers for once again heading up this cache hiding effort. It adds a little pizzazz to the fun of hiding new geocaches for the local community. And we can always use a little pizzazz. I saw this awesome idea for a way to kind of recycle old geocaching stuff. This is what Nikki Lynn, a newer geocacher, shared. We just found our 150th geocache. I have put all of our awesome treasures in this lamp. I shake it up once in a while. I bought this lamp at Walmart in Ontario a few years back for those who are wondering where I got it. <laughs> she shared a few pictures of a pretty basic lamp, but the base is replaced with a large clear jar and the lamp and shade are attached to its lid. Inside the jar, they added a whole lot of collected or traded swag. It looks pretty neat, and it's a practical use of things and a convenient storage spot to boot. The treasure lamp. <laughs> Toughen it up a bit, and maybe it could even be converted into a geocache. Because, of course, we all love lamp post caches. <laughs> Finally, another very cute little craft was shared by Kevin Divizia, a.k.a. Captain Math. A set of crocheted, I believe, gif gnomes. And this is what Kevin wrote. These adorable handmade trolls made by my crafty wife found homes with happy owners after our GIF event today. Some of them were prizes for our top four winners in our post-GIF Geo game show. One troll-loving family even let their new family member guide them back home through New Jersey traffic. And he included a photo of one of the fluffy gnomes gracing the dashboard of one of the winner's cars. See, so, you now that's a fun way to keep the theme going and just spread a little bit of joy to take home after a great event. I don't know if they'd make great cash swag, because uh, yarn and knitted things tend to get pretty matted and dirty sitting all alone in a cache between finders, but this was a neat idea. You can see pics and visit the link in, you guessed it, the show notes. <laughs> Oh, right, there was one more thing to share in this episode, and, well, he'd be pretty sad, I think, if I didn't include him. Let's ask our good friend George, the artificial geocaching adventurer, to try his hand at writing up a poetic earth cache description. This was inspired by a post from an Ontario geocacher, Juice Pig, who used AI to create a poem about an earth cache in the Canadian Shield. <clears throat> hey, George... Write a beautifully poetic description, including instructions for an earth cache in the Canadian Shield at a very prominent natural phenomenon. The earth cache should include five stages, including a final location where each location requires the geocacher to observe something or perform a task before moving on to the next stage. It should be in the style of poetry. Whispers in the Shield, a geological sonnet. In the heart of the shield where granite sentinels stand, their ancient tales etched in the rugged land. Upon this stage the geocacher weaves a poetic journey through eons it retrieves. Stage 1. The Granite Guardian Majestic cliffs in granite attire bear witness to time unyielding and tire. Feel their cool embrace a story to glean in the heart of the shield where secrets convene. Stage 2. The Dance of Water and Stone 
A waterfall, a cascade's embrace, water and stone, a ballet of grace. Observe the dance, the liquid's ballet, erosion's art on this geological ballet. Stage three, the mossy veil. In hidden groves where mosses repose, nature's tapestry in verdant throes. Touch the moss, feel its ancient caress, a resilient witness to earth's finesse. Stage four, the whispering wind. On panoramic heights, the wind's soft sigh, geological tales on breezes fly. Feel the whisper, the silent lore of forces that shaped this land of yore. Stage five, the sentinel's embrace. In sentinel's arms, ancient and wise, where time's heartbeat softly lies, capture the essence in a photograph's glance, a legacy left for the geocacher's advance. In logs let verses unfurl and unfold, observations and reflections a story told. This earth cache a poetic traverse through the shield's whispers in geological verse. Uh, George, I don't think those stages will pass muster with the Earth Cash reviewer. Feel their cool embrace, observe the dance, touch the moss, and feel the whisper. <laughs> well, at least you required a photograph from the location. <laughs> well, folks, that's all for this show. Do me a favor and hit the like button or give the show a thumbs up or positive review if you enjoy it so that it can spread to more people. And if you have any adventures you'd like to share on the show, I'd love to hear from you. Any comments, funny stories, milestones, accomplishments, rants, or adventures, please email tgif at cashtheline.net or phone one in by calling to leave a message at www.cashtheline.net slash POI. Links and references mentioned in this episode can be found in the show notes linked in the description. And if you'd like to join the band of excellent adventurers who help support Cash the Line and this podcast, please find us on Patreon or by visiting cashtheline.net slash Patreon. Support for as little as a cup of coffee per month or with a discount by the year and get bonus swag and access to exclusive content. Thanks for listening and see you next time with more exploration into the wide world of excellent geocaching adventures. And as always, happy caching and excellent adventuring.